It's been that long, huh? I am so friggin' old. Hey everyone, it's the Koopa Man. So it has been some decade, huh? And to think all of this started because some journalists couldn't keep it in their pants when getting sexual offers from some indie devs for positive coverage. Yup, we're going there. The dead movement that will never die. We are talking about Gamergate. <laughs> Honestly, I wouldn't have done this either if it weren't all these hit pieces that are still coming out. It's the left's Vietnam. They keep having flashbacks because this is the first time they lost. And they won in the end. Even still, all the lies about what actually happened from articles to documentaries to the very Wikipedia entry itself. There is so much revisionist history you'd think it was written by the KGB. Or Adam Shea, the Checkmate Lincolnites teabag. Huh, I wonder what those two have in common. So grab your popcorn, this is gonna take a while. While the main controversy is 8 years old, the build-up lasted for a good long while. See, the thing about the games industry and games press is they've always been a fair bit scummy. Heck, having a lying press that are just fluffers for the big game company is part of what caused the 89 video game crash. The infiltration of left-wing activism into otherwise unrelated communities and hobbies has been an old thing as well, with examples of infiltration into Hollywood through the unions, and the fall of atheism through Atheism Plus. Though let's be honest, the latter one was inevitable, because when you deny God into your being, it leaves a God-shaped hole, and here comes the new religion's priest to fill it with their bullshit. Though if I had to put a rough date on when Gamergate was inevitable, I'd say it'd be somewhere in 2012. That was the year of Dorito Gate, where Jeff Keighley was approved by the Orange Smoke as the Holy Pontiff of the Dew. Though more seriously, it was the year of the Mass Effect 3 ending scandal, where consumers of the Mass Effect series were called entitled babies for demanding their $60 to be well spent. Journalists and devs on the game, devs who were there new to the third game solely and weren't there for the first two, and devs that we'd later come to find out were friends with the journalists, would bash on anyone who dare suggest that the grand climax finale of their space opera series should have more deaths than a choice that Professor Oak would give you. And that wasn't even the only time consumers were being called entitled and attacked and even doxxed that year. Other examples even aren't in gaming. You can only push people so far before they start getting angry and push back. And the pushing after 2012 was just getting more and more frequent, blatant, and aggressive. Now if you were paying attention, you'd notice that not once have I mentioned feminism or social justice at all. You see, dear viewer, while those things were a major part of the anti-Gamergate side, they were not then, now, or ever what Gamergate was about. At all. It's true, when the left-wing activists did take sides against those arguing for Gamergate, they became the enemy, and Gamergate would become a battlefield for what largely can be called the culture war. It never once was about pushing women, feminists, SJWs, communists, or anyone out of gaming or the gaming industry. Gamergate at the end of the day was about one thing, ethical journalism. Gamers were sick and tired of having obvious paid shills lie to them about broken or disappointing games, and game journalists were using their position of the relay between the consumer and the industry to practice nepotism and promote their friends and fuck buddies. And believe me, when it's said that the practice of game journalism was incestuous, the sexual undertones are very much implied. You see, the kinds of people who became game journalists shared one thing in common. They were losers. No, not because they were gamers, they very much weren't, but because they were failed journalists. They were never hired by the game's media for their credentials as gamers and enthusiasts, a mistake that every enthusiast press thinking that they were going to go legitimate will make. So instead of hiring people who are hobbyists and enthusiasts, people who know their craft and enjoy games, they hired people with journalism degrees who didn't have the chops for Washington Post or the New York Times, complete with the same politics of a writer for said papers. And these writers knew it. Like in a future video where I'm going to point out the semi-competent competitive players are being assholes because they know they're in the middle of the road of their field, game journalists had to give themselves self-superiority over us plebs and sexists because they knew they aren't where they want to be and never will be. It honestly explains the deluded narcissism of someone like Leia Alexander. If she had the chops, she'd be on CNN where she wants to be right now, but she isn't. 
Also explains why so many game journalists men abuse their position of mouthpiece of the industry to get laid by indie devs with looser morals willing to do anything to get their game out there. Particularly if said game was a means of pushing their message and an end to justify the means. Ironic that these men would claim to be true feminists while basically engaging in the sort of Harvey Weinstein-esque casting couch culture, and yet these devs, also self-avowed feminists, saw no issues with it at all. Which brings us to the thing that kicked off Gamergate. The proverbial straw that broke the camel's back, if you will. On August 16, 2014, a blog was posted by the boyfriend of an independent game developer who went by the name of Aaron Gioni. Gioni? Chikajoni. I can't pronounce his name. In this blog, he detailed about how the developer, staying nameless for a reason, basically abused him emotionally and cheated on him with five other men within the gaming industry, including game journalist Nathan Grayson. These allegations were quickly denied by Kotaku editor Steven Totillo, who remarked that the only time the two met was on a show called Game Jam, which would later be discovered that this developer was trying to make into a break into reality TV, and was quickly derailed. Most on the internet just let this blog brush aside. Just an ex venting about a failed relationship, really. Wasn't their business. Two people, however, read deeper into this than most. Those being Mundane Matt and Mr. Medicare, then called Internet Aristocrat. They both made videos on how if the blog was true, it would prove what everyone already knew about the games industry and game journalism, how it's nepotistic and incestuous, and that this was a major breach in ethical standards in journalism on behalf of those five guys. Later that evening, Monday's Matt's video was falsely copyright struck by the dev in question. Pulling on that thread, people searched the developer's Patreon page and discovered that several journalists, including Ben Kuchera, who, while not named in the blog, did review the developer's latest game. What was worse is that this was not an exception, but the norm. Another journalist, Patricia Hernandez, had several affairs within the gaming scene, and the unnamed developer also had slept with one of the judges of an indie award show in which he won. If you notice, the people I am naming are all journalists. There's a reason for this, but we already discussed it and we will get back there soon. That being when Polygon updated their standards and practices code so that journalists can no longer contribute to the Patreons of the developers they cover and must disclose their donations. Did the guilty party admit fault for doing something that was obviously unethical and abusive to the consumer for the sake of enriching themselves? Nope. No, no they did not. Rather than reflect on themselves, they blame the gamers, call them sexist and misogynists for not wanting an enthusiast press to promote their friends based on nepotism. This would start a back and forth between gamers and third wave feminist activists and other varieties of leftists, Marxists, and social justice warriors that would eventually be dubbed Gamergate by Adam Baldwin of Firefly fame. This gave gamers a banner they could rally under. It unfortunately also opened gamers to attacks by the enemy. Discussion on the now named Gamergate or related talk was banned on almost every website, forum, social media, and comments section. This would largely lead to the formation of the subreddit known as Kotaku in Action, an offshoot of Tumblr in Action, founded by the users David Mee and Alex the Hatman Baldwin. No relation to Adam Baldwin, and also both of them have no relation to the Baldwin brothers. As a response, the major game journalism outlets would all publish articles declaring gamers dead. Referred to now as the fittingly named Gamers Are Dead articles. On the same day, some within minutes of each other, all sharing the same talking points. This was obviously coordinated, which itself also violated ethical standards. And to no one's surprise, it was coordinated. Leaks of an IRC server called Game Overgate and a mailing list called Game Journalist Pro show just how deep and embedded this incestuous relationship among game journalists was. It was a veritable hive mind of journals where they basically collaborate behind closed doors to control narratives and push talking points on the unsuspecting public. It was rather sick and creepy if I were to be honest. The Gamers Are Dead articles outlined Gamergate supporters as angry white men who just wanted to keep women and minorities out of gaming, which was never what it was about, but as Joseph Goebbels said, if you tell a big enough lie and keep repeating it, eventually people will believe it. Ironic that it's the supposed anti-Nazis who keep using Nazi tactics, am I right? 
In response, the hashtag Not Your Shield was formed where women, minorities, and other marginalized groups would show their support for Gamergate and demand that the journalists and leftists stop using them as their shield to push their agenda and to own up for themselves and take responsibility for their actions. Which would lead to journalists, devs, and activists denying these people's existence and identities and calling them sock puppets for white men. That is, as in sock puppets accounts of people who were only posing as, quote, marginalized groups. Most infamously by the indie darling Tim Schafer, who threw away any and all credibility he had to virtue signal to the message by denying the identities of people he supposedly believed were marginalized so that he, the white man, would speak for them on what they really believe. Gamer Gate would get support from alternative figures like Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, journalists like Ben Shapiro and Milo Yiannopoulos, both of whom leaned to the right and to whom none of this was new. Podcaster Steven Crowder of Louder with Crowder, also right-leaning. And Total Biscuit, a figure who had been beating the drum for ethics and game journalism for a while at this point. New figures as well would find their 15 minutes of fame discussing Gamergate, such as Carl Benjamin, then Sargon of Akkad, B. Monroe, previously mentioned Mr. Medicare and Monday Matt, and others. To go over each of them and where they are now would take a video of its own, which I may do someday if we get to 10 years and this still doesn't friggin' die, but whatever. Unfortunately, the mainstream would take sides against gamers and against Gamergate, most infamously by giving people who had nothing at all to do with the controversy airtime on late night and mainstream news. Law & Order would also make a cringeworthy episode about the controversy, basically calling gamers Nazis, murderers, rapists, and terrorists in the process. Noticing a pattern? Anytime gamers tried to say anything or discuss an ethical breach, the mainstream left would lie. They would use their connections, power, influence, and smears to shut down any assumed opposition, such as Gamergate, and then cry about how they were oppressed by the patriarchy. This would even include getting Gamergate supporters banned from real-life conventions, like with the Honey Badgers at Calgary Expo, and even call in bomb threats at real-life meetup events and discussion panels on journalistic ethics. Twice. You heard me right, folks. They called in bomb threats to use SWAT teams to attack their opposition, a tactic that then was considered extreme and now is considered attempted murder. But it's only okay when it's done by leftists as demonstrated when Keffels was allegedly swatted and called it a murder attempt, but then encouraged their fan base to SWAT sitting representative Marjorie Taylor Greene. And yet they still saw themselves as the oppressed and the virtuous. And that's the main reason why they cannot let it die. These people need to see themselves as virtuous and good, and they need to see their opposition as literally Hitler. Seriously though, we've heard a lot about extremism recently, a nastier, harsher atmosphere everywhere, more abuse and bother boy behavior, less friendliness and tolerance and respect for opponents. All right, but... What we never hear about extremism is its advantages. Well, the biggest advantage of extremism is that it makes you feel good because it provides you with enemies. Let me explain. The great thing about having enemies is that you can pretend that all the badness in the whole world is in your enemies and all the goodness in the whole world is in you. Attractive, isn't it? So, if you have a lot of anger and resentment in you anyway, and you therefore enjoy abusing then you can pretend that you're only doing it because these enemies of yours are such very bad persons. And that if it wasn't for them, you'd actually be good-natured and courteous and rational all the time. Now, once you're armed with one of these super lists of enemies, you can be as nasty as you like and yet feel your behaviors morally justified. So you can strut around uh, abusing people and telling them you could eat them for breakfast and still think of yourself as a champion of the truth, a, a, a fighter for the greater good are not the rather sad paranoid schizoid that you really are. The fact that people rose up against them to begin with was just alien to them. After all, why would someone rise up against, quote, good people? Of course, it also showed others who were getting sick and tired of the leftist agenda and pushing itself into their hobbies that fighting back is an option. Kicking off successor movements like Comicsgate and Metalgate, it even factored into the grassroots support of Donald Trump and the MAGA movement in some small way. In the end, though, it mattered very little. Most of the same people who were in the business then are still game journalists now. Websites would change hands a number of times, but it largely remained the same. We would even see the fall of a few indie game journalists, people like Gangry Joe, Jim Sterling, and the like, who would become just as bad, if not worse, than the professionals, just on the basis that they share the same ideological leanings. 
It's even more sad that it's near impossible for those who weren't in the aware back then, in those days, to find the truth as it's been heavily obscured as time went on, censored and rewritten on places like Wikipedia and 4chan to look favorably to those in power. It just seems a bit futile is all I'm saying. Perhaps someday we will do what we should have done. If the game journalists cannot be trusted as they are not fans or gamers, we should just write our own reviews. You already see this with aggregator sites like Metacritic and audiences preferring the opinions of audiences rather than those of the critics. Until then, never forget what this was really about, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. This has been the Koopa Man. Game on.